you, thank you, very nice. Um, lots of familiar faces once I put my glasses on, so it's <laughs> nice to see everyone. And um, thank you so much to the Alumni Association and the college for inviting me and sticking with me uh, the last year so I could come and, and present. Um, you know, when you hear that I've done different presentations over the years, you can only guess the hottest topic is what Dr. Wren and I are talking about today. And it certainly um, has taken over a lot of the attention. Um, some of it, um, we need the pathophys, we need to understand the mechanisms of action, we need to understand what drug use and drug abuse is. Um, I'm going to take you in a little bit different direction. I'm going to talk about um, what I see in the pain management world and I'm going to talk some about what we see in the world of addiction. And um, I feel as many, many, many pain experts and professors and physicians and pharmacists have stated across the country that we've put both addiction and chronic drug abuse and chronic pain abuse um, in one basket. And they're really very separate issues. We've got an issue with prescription drug abuse. Nobody, you'd be a fool to argue that. Lots of problems. But we also have a public health crisis with chronic pain. They're very, very different, but we've stuck them all in one container. And that's really muddied the water for treatment and for an approach to both. So that's really the, the, um, the feel of what I'm going to take today with you. I entertain um, your questions. If there's something in my PowerPoint that you would like to have, maybe you want the reference sheet. I tried to um, do it in the correct format. I can't guarantee I did. I tried. Um, but I've got a lot of references. There's so much out there. Um, much of it's been years ago that's still classic information, but certainly the last two years the information has been abundant. Um, again, lots of it is incredibly valid. We want to always look at it. In my perspective, in healthcare, we've got to look as, as the patient's advocate. And that may be in the direction of helping them with addiction, and that may be in the direction of helping them with pain management, and Lord knows it may be the issue of both. Okay? So that's going to be our talk today. Um, there's my objectives, and um, thank you again to Joan and to all those that helped look at this and what some of the questions were and the response from many of you wanting different aspects of this talk to cover. Um, I don't have any financial conflicts of interest, and I'm going to hope not to discuss anything off-label. Um, if I do, uh, stop me, and I'll try to stop it. Um, I loved it when Dr. Rand talked about the pendulum and that's really the way I talk about this. Um, because I'm old and I've practiced in pain a very long time, it's amazing the differences that we've seen from 25 and 30 years ago but also what we've seen swing one way and now I feel we're going to start to see swing back the other. So I'm going to walk you through some of those specifics and really piggyback on the lack, uh, last lecture um, and give you some ideas from a pain specialty perspective um, why we're seeing some of the challenges that we are. Um, many of us have heard of Margot McCaffrey. Um, we really idolize her because she's a nurse and because she literally helped us revolutionize pain management. Her doctorate, or her master's thesis, excuse me, was on pain in uh, 19, the late 1960s. It was novice to even talk about it, and her research was done, and from that came pain's whatever the person says it is, and it exists whenever they say it does. And I could probably gather most of us in this room have heard that. Um, is that still true? Well, sure it is. Our glitch is, I'm never going to prove or disprove what patients tell us. I'm also not necessarily going to write them a script or increase their opiate because they have pain. And that's where our challenge has happened. We've seen this over-prescribing or this escalation of doses um, that isn't what this meant from the very beginning. Okay? So again, we got to look at it with a little bit different set of glasses and realize that there's many, 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 many approaches to managing pain. 
mid 80s, here came the World Health Organization ladder. Um, we never really used it a whole lot, but it's a nice um, way to look at pain management. And it was really meant to look at a starting spot and how we walked along a ladder to be able to manage pain. Always realizing that if pain was severe or end of life and it was comfort care only, we might jump right to the top of that. Um, this was really developed to look at cancer pain um, that by the way, we still have a long ways to go when it comes to pain management. And so once again, there's tools out there that have been out there for a long time and it might um, help to revisit it. Again, we didn't use this a whole lot, but it brings you back some of that history of where we've been. So then came the 90s. And for those of us that have been um, in healthcare for a while, um, what was the most common modality that we used in the 90s and 80s to manage pain in the hospital? I am injections, okay, I am injections. And then I remember when we started to use fewer and fewer of them, some of the nursing instructors would say, how are we gonna get our I am um, clinical passed? Or you know, you had that set of criteria because we weren't giving them. Nearly, it was a fraction. We realized there were a lot of risks. According to the research, there was a lot of risks with IMs. It was really not a good modality. Uh, patients hated them. And it tended to cause pain when we wanted to alleviate pain. And no matter how we wanted patients to predict and call us ahead of time, um, they rarely did it. And so out came the PCA pump, patient-controlled analgesia pump, and that was really revolutionary in the 90s to start to change our acute management, uh, post-op pain, trauma pain in the hospital setting. There was hardly any evidence on pain treatment. It was just starting to get underway in the 90s. Um, pain was not routinely assessed. Um, multimodal wasn't even part of our verbiage. And we're gonna talk more about that. Some incredibly neat things are going on with multimodal um, medication ideas and modality ideas. And opioids were primarily used for all types of pain. Um, and this was, again, where some of our challenge started. If somebody had chronic, non-malignant back pain, it was common that they may be put on opiates for weeks or months or years of time. And obviously, we're seeing some of the effects of that now. Um, their pain may have started being an eight out of 10, and six months later, it was still an eight out of 10, but they were on doses of medications that were quite horrific. So we know, overall, long-term chronic opiate use is not effective for many, many types of chronic pain. But that's all we had then. And that's all we knew at the time. So that's what often got prescribed. Non-opioids were underutilized. Not a lot was out there about NSAIDs. Um, we just started to see um, ibuprofen and Motrin um, offered over the counter and Aleve. And um, it was really an under underutilized drug class. Um, now we know, um, while there's certainly um, may be very, very good uses for that, we always want to be aware of balance and what's the right combination for that patient. Following in through the 90s, um, 92 and 94, um, the Agency of Healthcare Policy and Research, and now it's not even called that, um, but they were starting to come out with national pain guidelines. And these were people that were the who's who of pain, including many people from Iowa. Um, Keila Herr, a nursing professor still at the U, um, Joanne Eland that passed away last year with pediatric pain, lots of physicians, professors, pharmacists. It was really an interdisciplinary group around the country that helped develop both the acute pain and then the cancer pain guidelines. And we use these as our Bibles. Um, they really started to change how we managed acute pain and cancer pain. Now this was back in the early 90s. But I want you all to think about, those of you that have worked with somebody post-op recently, do you still see pain minimal to non-existent for a post-op patient? I mean, this was 1992, and we still have a huge challenge with post-op pain. And then you throw in our national focus about opiates and the fear of using them with pain management, and it's even increased some of our challenges of post-op and trauma pain management. 
Um, we heard about pain as the fifth vital sign. You know, it was so well intentioned. It was developed and really um, rolled out by the VA system, which by the way is often ahead of all of us when it comes to pain management. But they developed pain as the fifth vital sign with the good intention of having it be that important that along with vitals, we asked about pain. What happened is, of course, as we go on through history, it became kind of a mess. Um, but it was well-intentioned early on. And then came our friends from Joint Commission. And in the year um, 2000, first time ever that they came out with different standards about pain and pain management. Even the fact that pain needs to be assessed for all patients. There were places that hadn't even thought about assessing for everybody underneath their umbrella. So this was revolutionary. And um, some of us in the world of pain, you know, we get called every day asking us, what one document can you send to me that will pass all the JCO standards? Um, and you know, that's not quite how you do it. It has to become a culture change. But it again raised the bar and people were starting to notice it. The pain scale, zero to 10, really became a norm. Um, again, while it's a great scale, it's only one way to assess pain. There's many, 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 many ways to do that. So it became problematic as we look further in history where then we had people, um, including surveyors, that wanted us to give doses of meds based on the patient's pain score. So you see, with so much good, we also had some challenges. So there goes the pendulum, and it's swinging the other way. So we literally went from people um, doing circumcisions with nothing on board with those babies, doing open heart surgery in the NICU. We'd paralyze them with paralytics, but we didn't give those little newborns any analgesics. I mean, this was in the late 80s and early 90s. So now we're starting to see the pendulum swing where there's more research, we're more aware, pain education's being integrated into our curriculums. Um, we're starting to really change our culture and our facilities and our cancer centers. Um, and so under treatment and under prescribing was replaced with increased, often just opioid prescribing. And that was problematic. Is it the right patient for this med? Is it the right dose? Um, does this med even work on this kind of pain? You know, we don't think that a lot of patients with neuropathic pain, nerve or neuropathic, that opiates even work very good for that kind of pain. Um, but realistically, we still see it ordered very, very commonly for nerve or neuropathic pain. So again, it's realizing what kind of recipe is the right one for that patient. So we started to swing the other way. Increased opiate use, of course, increased our side effects. We started to see a lot more adverse events. Um, and that really led to a lot of the discussion about safety. You know, our hospital started to get very focused on patient safety. Many of us could talk about what we had seen with PCA doses. We saw deaths. We saw patients with incredible respiratory depression. Um, I just reviewed four IRIS reports from the month of March. And I'm gonna tell you, we still have a long way to go about monitoring and appropriate dosing. So while we have very well-intentioned prescribers, we have to understand what we need to do for monitoring and what's the right balance with that patient. A lot of people have comorbidities. We're seeing incredibly wonderful intervention for people in their 80s and even early 90s, but we've gotta keep those patients safe with what we're giving them. Then, as was so well stated earlier, um, about the whole pressure of patient satisfaction and um, seeing that those numbers may equal different money based on your scores. Um, we know that um, a lot of the HCAPS um, questions when it comes to pain are gonna be removed in 2018 because there's been such an outcry and they realize that much of the way they were stated was not very good. Again, well-intentioned. We want to know if we're doing a good job with pain management, but you got to be really careful the way you ask those questions and what you do with that data. Again, with monitoring, you know, um, this is looked at constantly. There still are not national guidelines about what you should do to monitor with the patient with the PCA. 
Should we do CO2 monitoring? Should everybody have a pulse ox? I mean, what's the right way? We know of national groups that are looking at it, and there still is not a, a national standard. Um, and does more pain mean more opiate? You know, for those of you that might work with post-op uh, physical therapy, uh, post-op patients right after surgery, you know that when that stimulus of moving them and, and doing all kinds of things and they start to rest, their pain may get, they may doze off, but when we get in there and start messing with them, they're gonna want more for their pain. More opiate is often what we may see given, and then you may have a problem on your hands, right? About an hour later when they start to rest again. So what is the right amount? What is the right approach? We have lots of challenges with our range orders. This was really brought up um, when we started to see our JACO friends and our state surveyor friends come in and look at our facilities. And while we certainly want people to be able to help us, and there's some great opportunities based on their surveys, we also need surveyors that are very knowledgeable on what they're looking at. And that was problematic. Um, we actually had, uh, over the years, more than once, I've talked to surveyors and trying to understand what it is they're looking at and they want to see a link between a pain rating and what it is we give for a dose. So it's no secret that lots of places across the country have done orders for opiates based on patients' pain ratings. In other words, maybe zero to three is Tylenol, four to seven is one Vicodin five, and maybe eight to 10 is a Vicodin 7.5. Well, that's a terrible way to do pain management. I may be keeping your pain at a two because I'm giving you a 7.5. We never want people to go up that high. So it takes a lot of talk to work with those surveyors. Um, you don't want a dose based on a patient's number. Um, a lot of times in the cancer world, we may be keeping that patient with very advanced cancer at a one or two and very functional because they're taking 300 milligrams of oral morphine a day, okay? So you always have to look at the patient. You always have to look at what your goal is. There's a lot more adverse reactions that happen when you dose by numbers. It doesn't work. It isn't a good uh, modality. Nurses needed to get more education so we could articulate to those surveyors and we needed to help our surveyors learn and we did. We've done a lot of education with both JACO and the state. We also talk a lot about around the clock ATC, around the clock dosing, a much safer modality for a lot of patients in the acute care setting that have pain that's either constant or predictable. Okay, so a lot of you have heard me talk about this. Why would we ever make somebody coming from the ER after a bad trauma or car wreck, why would we make them request their analgesic when they're in severe pain? Why wouldn't we automatically schedule it around the clock? Patients have sustained a much better blood level, they don't peak and valley, and it really is a much safer modality to give it that way. Um, but it's still a hard nut to crack to crack in some facilities and to get people to really buy into that. And did we allow others to dictate our practice? In other words, you know, when you know a surveyor is coming in, it's frightening, they can be intimidating, and we tend to react when they may have a recommendation rather than maybe say, okay, hold on, I need you to show me that research. I need to better understand what it is you're requesting. I need to better understand that, that you understand the topic of pain. Um, that's not always easy to do, as we've just recently had that wonderful opportunity in our facility. We saw increased opioid prescribing. We saw an increased focus to drug abuse, prescription and non-prescription. We saw an increase in focus to healthcare safety, as we talked about. Um, lots more adverse outcomes and sedation going on all over. So what is the right approach? Um, I just looked at a case last month where it was 100 of Demerol and 10 milligrams of fentanyl, or 10 milligrams of Versed for um, a, a procedure. A, I didn't think we used that first word anymore at all. I thought we were done with that in our hospital systems, and we're not. Um, and Tanaver said um, we just would never usually give that much 
um, in a procedure area. So great physician, great provider, wonderful staff, but you see, we have some education there that really needs to happen. Um, the patient ended up doing okay after some reversal agent, um, but again, we have some work to do. And all of our, it really works with all of our positions and all of our jobs. We have some work to do. Let me spend a little bit of time on this slide. Um, as this is often a really big area of interest right now as we talk about the different guidelines that are out there. Um, and it's been no secret with the CDC guidelines, um, we had a media rush. And the media was all over these guidelines by the CDC. First of all, the, C the CDC is well known for being a really solid um, group, at least for the general public. We would feel confident in what they told us. So when they came out with these guidelines, um, it was really um, challenging for a lot of reasons. Let me start with um, 2016, the guidelines on the management of post-op pain. This was developed by the American Pain Society. And the APS is really known as um, kind of a, a pain guru society. They have a lot of pain physicians and nurses and pharmacists. Um, there's physical therapists. In fact, part of who developed those guidelines were PTs. Uh, they were professors. Um, they were nurses that some of us have heard of in the pain groups for quite a while. So they really developed a very strong interdisciplinary group to develop post-op post-op pain management guidelines, okay? Um, these came out last year, and we were excited about them, um, even though they really got overshadowed by the CDC guidelines. Um, so if you ever want to look at any of these, and there's many out there that you can Google, the APS are really noted for having strong pain guidelines. Um, the CDC guidelines, so let me tell you a little bit about those. You know, they first came out in um, 2015, in, in the fall of 2015, and there was so much um, criticism and concern by uh, physicians, nurses, anesthesiologists, primary care, that they really pulled them back and they announced that they were going to have a second period of time that they would take comments and um, relook at developing those guidelines. So while they put those guidelines back out for public, public um, comments, there was, again, a lot of pushback by um, those in the pain management world, but also anesthesiologists, cancer pain specialists, physical therapists, um, that they virtually just put them out as they had first published them. Um, I am not saying everything is good or bad about any of these guidelines. What I'm going to do is I'm planting some seeds with you all so that you can see when it comes to the topic, it's very challenging to have black and white guidelines. You know, when it comes to pneumonia, we know what antibiotic to give you when you hit the ER, or we know what it is you need to do to go to the cath lab with an X amount of time when you come to the ER with an acute MI. But when it comes to pain management, we don't have guidelines that black and white. It's why the research is essential for many, many, many reasons. So when we looked at the CDC guidelines, um, there was really a lot of pain experts that had a host of concerns. And um, I won't go through all of those with you by any course, because I'd bore you to death. But we had people, some of us have heard of Judy Pace, a PhD at Rush in Chicago, a nurse we've had here to speak before, very strong pain knowledge, um, highly critical that they did not have an open panel that they did not have really a panel made up of an interdisciplinary group, that it was very, very uh, focused on opiate use and pain, again, together, rather than separating the two topics. Um, lots of medication amounts that they really talked about in their guideline as far as not going over or really um, put a lot of fear in primary care and cancer pain specialists about what they could or couldn't prescribe. So it was so well-intentioned, 
but I think it's going to take more than just one group to be able to actually come up with guidelines that we can work with and have some solid, solid guidelines out there. Um, the Agency for Healthcare um, Research and Quality also put out another set. Um, 2017, they were revised from 2010. Here's our friends from the VA. Opioids for Chronic Pain, a new clinical guideline from the VA and the Department of Defense. And it's, it's very good and very good to read. They really did a widespread review of what's out there in the research. And there are many, many state-specific guidelines, which I want to tell you should scare us. We've got state legislators developing pain guidelines developed on their scare of their opiate deaths. And that's really no way to do this. Um, then we've got non-healthcare people developing guidelines um, because it's a terrible problem, prescription opiate deaths and abuse. It's a terrible problem. But again, that's one thing and chronic pain is another. And we've got to be careful what we cross over. Um, I know New York, Washington State, Ohio, Louisiana, Oregon, um, those are just a few. Another one just came out in 2017. Um, it's um, often, and this was Tennessee, it's often going to be the governor or the senator that announces the guidelines, and they're very proud of them, and they're well-intentioned. Um, but I don't know that we want legislative people writing our pain guidelines. Okay, let me push in a little bit different direction. You know, I had never even heard of this pains project, ever. And so it was good for me to have to do some research for this um, lecture. Um, it's, uh, it's really called the state of chronic pain in 2016, and that's when it was developed. Um, it was presented by the uh, Pain Action Alliance to implement a national strategy, and it was a, a division of the Health and Human Services. Um, so is the CDC. So it would have been great if they could have worked together. Um, this came out about a month after the CDC guidelines last year, so you can only imagine that this was lost in the firestorm. The media, and still is, extremely focused on the CDC guidelines. So once again, I hadn't even seen this report or even read that it was in uh, much of our pain literature. Came out in March, provided a plan to transition from a biomedical pain care model to one that was comprehensive and a biopsychosocial chronic disease management model. You know, that's really what chronic pain is. It's not just a pain model that's all physical. As we heard, again, with the great lecture about the pathophysiology of pain, there's a lot of complexities with that. And we know that once those pain pathways are charged and charged and charged and overstimulated with chronic pain, that even once we often, um, often even once we stop the actual pain, it won't stop that impulse. It changes the way that pain pathway works. So that's why people with chronic non-malignant pain, even once we may have that cause gone, maybe it's somebody that we've done an amputation to take off a toe that had gangrene. Even once that toe is gone, what do they often complain about to us? Their toe pain. They can still feel it. They'll tell you. They think they're crazy. They can feel it, but it's gone. Okay? There's lots of science and there's a lot of emerging research about chronic pain that in the next 20 or 30 years is going to help us so much with knowing how to manage it and what to do with it so that we're able to really manage it better. And that doesn't necessarily include an opiate in any dimension of that plan of care. The report arrived right after the CDC guidelines. Um, so once again, you know what happened. The attention was on the CDC guidelines, the media, the general public, healthcare providers, and policymakers wanted to take that document and develop um, law from that. Um, still, very little attention with this document. And what's interesting, and there's so many similarities between what the CDC is trying to do and what this document really pushes. Um, first of all, chronic pain and addiction are both defined um, the state of pain for 2016. They both are public health issues. Addiction's a terrible public health issue, but so is chronic pain. 
They're both public health issues. And I would think if we could get people from all arenas to work together, we'd certainly have a better approach to being able to look at um, what we could do. The CDC guidelines tell us that there's 33,000 unintentional deaths in 2015 due to opioids. I don't doubt that a minute, and that's probably conservative. It's difficult for chronic pain issues to compete with this kind of focus because those are really dramatic amounts. Um, and most of us know people that have had an issue with addiction. Family members um, in healthcare, there's a lot of healthcare workers that have this, this issue. There's no doubt people here in the room. It's really rampant. So when we hear those kinds of numbers, we all want an easy fix and it's not that simple. Two important public health issues are pitted against each other instead of potentially working together uh, and we might get a little bit further with it. Again, both are um, the opioid use disorders and chronic pain are both diseases. Both the patient populations have been stereotyped, stigmatized, and poorly served. There was a lot of this that came out with the CDC guidelines. Um, I'm gonna talk in just a minute about the VA patients and what we see in today's world that we've never seen before with some of our vets. And that was really a strong patient group. And our cancer patients. We have patients with cancer pain, even end of life pain, um, may be very close to death and they still don't want to take opiates because they're afraid of addiction. They might be afraid of the stigma. They're afraid to tell people what they're on for their medications. Um, so it's still a very real fear. Both require, both require more research. Both need more data and, and analysis. Um, so any of you looking for research opportunities, there's a lot in the field. And both call for a public health response. Um, I think we'll see a lot of resources join um, and really try to do more with being better in both arenas. I'm going to stop there for just a minute and see as we talk about our guidelines and what some of you see in your areas of practice. Um, any questions or any comments to some of that information? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, let me think a minute. Anybody in the audience, help me out, because I know you nurses hear it all the time. Um, the question was, when we look at our HCAP surveys, what are the questions that patients are asked from that HCAP survey that's related directly to pain? I want to say they... Um, say, say, say it again. Was your pain... D did you have pain during your stay, yes or no? No. Was it adequately managed, yes or no? Did you feel that everything that could have been done was done to manage your pain? That's one of them. Um, it asks about non-drug. Doesn't it ask in addition to medication? Uh-huh. Something about non-drug. You, you'd think I'd know them because I got them everywhere. I've got the data. So if you're called after you've been in the hospital and you're asked to take a long survey, these now have to be done across the country. And countries, it's a pay for performance. So in other words, based on how good or not good hospitals do with these questions, this database, it will affect their pay with Medicare and Medicaid. And it can be dramatic. For Mercy, it's millions, millions every year. Um, so you, and, and you try to be good. You try to really look at patient satisfaction for a lot of reasons. But when it comes to those questions, um, it's very, very hard. Um, we don't have good research. That was my question when they first came out. What's best practice? Let's look at what's out there in best practice and we'll try to duplicate it. Let's look at what the research tells us and then we'll try to duplicate it. And it's just not there. We've got it there looking at um, education for medications. That's one of them. We've got different data and research about physician um, communication, and that's some of the questions. We've got solid research for much of them, but we don't have it for this. Um, what is the right question base? And why was the Department of Defense involved? I, I can see the VA, but why is it 
I think because of all the veterans. Uh huh. So I can see why it's being applied. I don't know if they are an outreach of that or why that was part of it, but they were. Yeah. Good question. Anything else? For those of you that work with patients with pain, because it's going to be many, many, many of your areas of practice, is there a particular patient group that you still see we have more challenges with that you feel we have some work to do? Say it again. The chronic pain. Chronic pain. Anything in particular? Yeah, CHF, congestive heart failure. Uh, it's a very, it can be very painful for patients. Uh huh. A lot of back pain, a lot of dyspnea, lots of air hunger. Um, we still have a long way to go with that patient group for pain management. Mm -hmm. Good example. What else? Arthritis. Arthritic pain. Because now they're shutting down how much these you can take. Uh huh. It's a, it's a um, balance, isn't it? It's constantly looking at risk versus benefit. What's the right medication for the right illness or disease? Um, arthritis, for the most part, has some kind of component of, of pain from bone or bone pain. May also have some nerve pain based on how that arthritis is doing. Is there some nerve impingement? Do we need to look at what do we use for bone pain? The NSAID group. Um, but being on it for 10, 20, 30 years can be problematic, right? So we've got some great drug classes in addition to opiates, but they may have a high side effect profile. So it's that constant balance. Mm -hmm. Yes? Chronic back pain, especially in our obese patients. Yeah, chronic back pain, especially in our obese patients. So think about um, what do you start with first, trying to get some weight loss, trying to manage that pain. It's often components of muscle and bone and nerve based on what's going on with that chronic low back pain. Mm -hmm. Could it be something that they need to take by mouth? Oftentimes, chronic pain in that, with that chronic back pain, it's multimodal. We gotta be looking at, at medication, but lots and lots of non-drug. Lots of PT and exercise and maybe a TENS unit and maybe warm water pool and blah, 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 blah. That takes a lot of time for that primary provider to assess that patient and develop that kind of care plan, that's not a five minute office visit. Hmm? Say that again. Knee pain, those bone pains. Yep, a lot of us old nurses, a lot of us old, you know, PTs. Um, we, we get some of those pains and it's hard. Anybody else? Yes, Jean. Uh, fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia. How good do you think we are at that? We don't have all the healthcare providers even convinced it's a true disease. Mm -hmm. We don't have fibromyalgia pain guidelines to know what to do and what not to do. We kind of hit it through different directions. Um, we, we're getting there, but we think that some of the non-drug interventions probably work better than medication modalities. You know, But it's a heck of a disease when you see it with patients and what it affects with their quality. Okay, here's some of our facts. Um, chronic pain, um, diabetes, coronary artery disease, heart disease, stroke, and cancer. So you can see what chronic pain does to compare to some of those other disease or illnesses. <clears throat> Let me talk a minute, uh, a minute about use versus abuse. I'm gonna change gears just a little bit with you. And let's talk about these categories of pain. When I talk about acute pain, Acute pain, for the most part, is going to be pain that's either from surgery or from trauma. Okay, So it's a very specific kind of pain. For the most part, we know that about 80% of patients who have some kind of surgery are going to have pain. Okay, it's, That's going to happen. It's going to do surgery, they're going to have pain. 75% of those of that 80% will report moderate, severe, or extreme pain. Now these are 2016 statistics. So even in today's world, look at some of our challenges. 
with acute pain. Less than half report adequate pain relief. And the neg negative effects on unmanaged pain, think about it post-op. It's a higher incidence of pneumonia, of phlebitis, um, delay in recovery. Of course, help us all if they have an increased length of stay, because you know what kind of a challenge that becomes. Um, the risk of persistent post-op pain, it is believed more and more as chronic pain research is being done that much of chronic pain was acute pain that wasn't managed and, was, and went on and on and on and it developed into that chronic pain model. Again, we need more research in the area. Some of our initial pain guidelines and now the new ones by the APS that look at post-op pain. I'm not talking about long-term opiate use. I'm looking at post-operative pain management. We know that the research tells us, for the most part, the medication group of choice for acute pain, pain after surgery or pain after trauma, is opiates, an opiate-like medicine. Okay, so for many, many places, we don't want to do that with opiates. We know for acute pain, most patients respond to an opiate. Now our challenge is a lot of our patients pre-op are already taking doses of opiates that make it extremely challenging to manage in post-op. Okay, so I want to add that little sidebar. That's become um, the last couple of years an incredibly challenging patient group is many of our patients after surgery already were taking doses pre-op. I know a lot of surgeons that do elective surgery, I don't know if you can call total joints elective, but um, doing total joints, doing some of those elective surgeries, they will have that patient work with either a pain provider or look at um, their primary care provider to decrease that daily dose before they ever do surgery on them. Or it is incredibly challenging to manage that post-op pain. American Pain Society recommends, of course, education. Some of our best model comes from our joint replacement. They do um, class, pre-op with joint class, and really we see a big change in that. They kind of use that wellness model where the patient knows they're gonna be expected to get up, to exercise, to move that joint. Um, it's an expectation. Um, they're educated about pain, and so they're much more prepared. We just talked about this um, with open heart surgery. And is there some opportunities for other surgeries if we can plan them ahead to do some education? Um, we still see patients post open heart. Just had a patient a couple weeks ago, a young man in his 50s. He literally thought he was gonna have no pain. He swears that's what he heard from his surgeon, okay? I I'm not doubting him, I'm not doubting him. But you can imagine his surprise when it was not zero. Okay, it was not zero. He had a big challenge post-op, uh, big challenge with his post-op pain. Our assessment, medical and psychomorbidities, lots of them. Um, we know we have behavioral health issues in our population. We know we don't have good resources. It adds to the complexity of this topic. Um, the meds, the chronic pain, the substance abuse, certainly um, APS recognizes that in their post-op pain guidelines. Adjust the dose to response and side effects. That doesn't necessarily mean you increase the dose. It means you adjust it. Ongoing pain assessment is huge and multimodal. And I'm gonna talk more about that. Multimodal is a dramatically important piece of looking at acute pain management, like post-op or post-trauma. Um, that also includes our non-drug interventions and our cognitive behavioral. Um, JACO just came out with some potential new survey questions, um, not survey questions, potential new regulations that they're gonna put in their criteria of what they look at when they survey. And um, they're not done and they're not out, but a lot of what they're looking at is how much we do non-drug interventions. And is that part of our natural aspect of doing pain management in the acute care setting? Um, I think it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to look more at that. The APS talks about medication therapies, oral versus IV, 
Um, the PCA may certainly be useful if your patient can't take something by mouth and right away post-op or post-trauma, they may not be able to. Um, you really wanna consider avoiding that basal or continuous dose if that patient is opiate naive. We see too many problems with that patient, even at one milligram of morphine an hour. It may be too much for that patient. Once they get sleepy or sedated, it's much, much safer to let them dose. Then if they're sleepy, they won't push it. Avoid IMs is a given. Monitor sedation and respiratory depression. Um, we have a long way to go to make this more universal. It's very important with opiates that we're monitoring sedation and respiratory status. You know, your patient's gonna get sleepy before they run into trouble with their respirators. So you wanna get in there and you're assessing that level of sedation. It's imperative that's part of our assessment, especially post-op. Um, use of both Tylenol, APAP, and NSAIDs. Um, at least consider, doesn't mean we're, we're gonna do it, but at least consider, could that be an option? or an adjunct to our therapy. And pre-dosing, we're seeing, um, again, our orthopedic physicians are a good example. They do a lot of pre-dosing. Um, with some other, we're seeing a real big um, consideration with IV ketamine. Some of our patients coming into the hospital, into the ERs, um, pre-op or post-trauma on very high home opiate doses. Um, lots of information's out there on IV ketamine, and is that an option? Um, we're seeing it used very selectively so far, but some really good results. So that may be a potential. And again, looking at multimodal. What does that mean? It means a variety of analgesic meds and techniques. So you wanna hit that pain in a lot of different ways. Um, instead of just using an opiate, could I use an NSAID? Would some Tylenol help? Is it that we've got some nerve involvement, so I wanna look at something for nerve pain? With heat packs, ice, um, what about physical therapy, warm water pool? Lots and lots of different ways. Uh, would maybe an actual block give some pain relief? Um, we're seeing more and more done with on cue pumps and being able to actually drip a little bit of a Novocaine-like med. What about a topical? What about some lidoderm? What about aspirin creams? Um, a lot of places, especially end of life, comfort care, palliative care, chronic pain centers look at um, compounding creams. Are there ways to look at compounding? Um, it's, it's not necessarily a topic that's discussed a lot in acute care and it has a lot of high opinions. I'm just throwing out ideas. Um, we know the acupuncture research is very strong with some chronic diseases. Um, it's one of the modalities with fibromyalgia. It's a strong modality to consider with arthritis. Um, any kind of nerve pain, there's some strong research about the use of acupuncture. So again, are there different ways? Wouldn't that be great if we had some non-drug interventions that we used on certain surgeries or post-op traumas because the research supported it? We use a lot of essential oils at the hospital. Um, lots of strong, and it's wonderful, it's a nursing intervention so you don't have to get a physician's order. We can implement that as the nurse taking care of the patient. And many of the floors and units have that as an option. There's some more information on multimodal. Um, some really strong recommendations with high quality evidence. So I wanted to list some of those for you. Um, again, it's always about balance and that risk benefit and seeing if there's other modalities. Um, some site specific peripheral regional anesthetic techniques. In other words, we're seeing surgeons now, they may put a lot of lidocaine into that tonsil bed so that it helps with the pain once they've done the surgery. They may um, use a lot more lidoderm um, or lidocaine, different kinds of cane medications. Are there other ways to attack that pain? Um, we're seeing more with, depending on the medical centers that you work in, are there some blocks that might be? If you're having a big chest or abdominal surgery, is there an epidural or an intrathecal that's an option? Um, so again, there may be some other options out there. Um, you got some of that in the earlier lecture. Um, I took that pain perception and then I stuck different medication groups out to the side. So it gives you an idea of kind of what works where. 
Um, when we do our one-day pain class, we spend a lot of time really talking about this and really trying to help, especially nurses, understand what might work where and why you may have a PRN list of four or five medications and how do you start to figure out what you might want to use or what might work for certain kinds of pain. Um, it doesn't mean that we're certainly not going to have as a nurse the same knowledge as a pharmacist. In fact, we have pharmacists help us teach this. Um, but it does give you an idea of what works where along that pain pathway and how can we interrupt that pain pathway in more ways than just an opiate. There's um, kind of a nice picture of what we look at with multimodal. Um, we love it when we have the benefits of opiate sparing. With post-op patients, um, somebody that doesn't have an opiate abuse history, I'm not worried about using opiates on them, but anytime you can get really great pain relief with less med, you've got the best of both worlds. They're more awake and alert and they're up and moving. I mean, that's the, the best of all worlds. So um, some ideas to consider on that. What about our use with malignant pain? So we talked a minute about acute. Now let's talk about malignant pain and some of our challenges. Um, we still have a long ways to go with end of life or malignant pain management. We know that there's incredible prescribers out there and people really trying to do a good job with this, but we still have some challenges. Uh, because of our opiate scare, because of our terrible issue with prescription drug abuse, um, we're seeing partial filling of prescriptions for patients. The patient has to then get another script for the remainder of that dose. A lack of opiates at pharmacies. I don't know if we've seen that in the Des Moines area. Have some of you? Julie, much? Short Just short? Okay. Okay. Not terrible. Okay. Um, I know some of the bigger countries, especially south, where they have incredible deaths every day. I know Ohio and Kentucky, some terrible statistics on opiate abuse deaths. Um, some of the pharmacies aren't even carrying opiates. Some of their ERs aren't carrying opi um, any opiates. Well, that's a problem for this patient group. Um, insurance and reimbursement limits, um, additional prescriptions and more co-pays. You know, part of what our pain nurse clinicians will do before a patient is discharged, if they're involved in their care, is to make sure that the script that they're going to go home on, that their insurance will cover it. Um, because there's a lot of different prescriptions that particular insurances won't cover. And if it's, you know, 7 p.m. at night, it's going to be really challenging to get something new for their pain. Refusal by pharmacies to fill and getting prior auth um, for um, opiates. Um, that said, I also want to reference that our pharmacy friends are incredible for us to work with. Many pharmacists and pharmacies in their defense are getting robbed. People are coming and there's a real fear of getting stolen and medications, so they want to work with this as much as um, everything, so that we're trying to look at a really confronted um, front. Cancer patients should be largely exempt from the regulations to restrict or limit opioids, and that was in the CDC guidelines. I'm afraid it wasn't um, more prominent because they really did say this is not for our cancer pain patients. Opioid therapy is first line for moderate to severe chronic pain with, that's associated with active cancer. Okay, So I may have an active cancer disease that I'm fighting and then I get a chronic back pain. Um, I may already be on an opiate for my cancer pain. And cancer survivors post-treatment, opioids may be appropriate if the benefits outweigh the risks. I feel we're really seeing cancer treatment as almost a chronic disease state because there's such great treatments and cancer patients will live for years past what we used to see for a life expectancy. But they may have chronic pain based on treatment, post-treatment, um, Radiation or chemo can cause neuropathy pain, so there may be other kinds of pain that we need to look at managing. When we look at palliative care, it is a growing specialty. Um, it's another one of the areas that I work with, and we still do a lot of education on what it is and what it isn't. 
Palliative care is not the same as hospice, but we work really closely with our hospice friends. When we're looking at palliative care, we're looking at patients that don't necessarily have a life expectancy of six months or less. Ideally, it's patients with an illness or disease that's not gonna be cured, and we work with them more upstream. So we're not working with people at that end of life, but we're able to help with pain and symptoms and a lot of life changes early. In other words, um, ALS patients, we want to be consulted at time of diagnosis. You're not going to cure that ALS, and we don't want that patient to have to wait till they're now nonverbal and can barely move before we're able to assist them. So we know that um, pain and symptom management is still a big aspect with these patients, and we need to help them. End of life care, of course, the dominant goal is pain and symptom management, so that would be an appropriate use. Um, we still see pain as often unrecognized or untreated, and in our provider's defense, we've all seen the patient. You know, you go in and check in, and, and Mary's in terrible pain, and she tells you she can barely move, and she's taken what's been ordered, but it's terrible. And in comes the doc and says, hi, Mary, how you doing? And what does Mary say? Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> okay. We know it's a problem. We know patients still have a very challenging time telling the truth. And we don't always take, as healthcare people, the time to specifically ask about their pain. Often, how you doing? Are you doing okay? That's not asking them about their pain. Okay? So it has to be a little bit more pointed when we talk about that. What about o opioids for chronic non-malignant pain? Um, certainly we see acute injury or trauma, that's one thing. Um, cancer treatment, when it's acute, that's one thing. But when we start to see other chronic uses in both of those categories, it starts to get problematic. Um, and it can get problematic very quickly. A lot of primary care physicians and NPs and PAs will ask us, you know, give me an algorithm or what about a stair step of what we do? And, and it's just not out there. It's very hard to wrap your arms around. I got another slide coming out that's gonna help a little bit. Um, sickle cell is very challenging. You may have somebody in an acute sickle cell crisis, and then there's the chronic pain of sickle cell. Um, they're not always, as a population, um, the easiest to work with for a lot of different reasons, and the research will tell us that we tend to stereotype this group. Um, there tends to be some real challenges, and it may be, it's certainly a population we see in the Des Moines area, but it's not overly common. So I don't know how good we get at it when we don't have people with this all the time. And of course, failed back surgeries. That can be a really big population of our chronic um, non-malignant pain. Here's our slide about veterans. And in 2014, um, JAMA put out a report that said an alarmingly high rate of chronic pain among members of the US military after deployment. It's about 44%. And the general public, to give you an idea, is 26. You know what that 44 is about? It's the first time in history that we're saving people in combat like we are. In all previous wars or conflicts, whatever you want to call it, a lot of people died in the field. But now we have such incredible ways to save people in the field, but they're coming home to us with very, very traumatic injury. And that sets them up for chronic pain. I mean, 44%, that's almost half of those people coming back to us after deployment. And while they may be going to fabulous care in the VA system, a lot of us see them in our places also. Okay, so it's something to keep um, in mind. It's also why um, we're seeing the VA system really trying to get their arms wrapped around this and help us. So how do we treat chronic pain? All that we talked about, the good, bad, and the indifferent about chronic pain and opiates. You have to do a thorough assessment. You have to be able to come up with a diagnosis. And that may mean that you need some diagnostics. You might need an MRI. You might need a scan. Um, you might need something else diagnostically so that you really can look at the best of your ability at a true diagnosis of what's going on with that patient. Establish a plan of care. The use of multimodal, so farm and non-farm. Use evidence-based practice, okay? Evidence-based practice. 
and there's lots of tools we use with chronic pain management. Our opiate risk tool, which is called an ORT, opioid agreements. So we're seeing these used in, of course, pain centers, but also primary care. We're seeing them used in cancer centers so that it's really clear who's ordering the opiate, what pharmacy it's going to, and it's very clear and it's stated. And both the patient and the provider sign that. And then urine drug screens. That's the other one. Um, that should be just a normal part of a pain clinic. A lot of times we're seeing it in um, primary care. If they're ordering opiates over, some of them are doing it over uh, 60 days, they'll automatically, not judging, automatically do a urine drug screen. It's just part of the, of the classic care. Um, I could also put on here, um, what's our pharmacy, um, what's the place we call to see what patients are taking? Yes, I would, yes, the pharmacy, what's it stand for? Medication? Yeah. Yes, okay. And um, all physicians, I didn't know all nurses had access to that, but we heard that a couple weeks ago. So you can literally call. It's got about a two-week lag time from what I understand, but you can call and see what Joan Beard's on, and am I getting scripts from a lot of different providers? What's my whole medication profile? I know in-house, and I know in the clinics it's used widely used widely used. Questions about treatment of chronic pain. Looks pretty easy, huh? Yes? Yes. Say, will you say that again? Okay. Under. Okay, and I got it. Randomly call for a patient I have. It has to be my provider's patient. Otherwise, it's a big deal. I got to get those guidelines better down because that's what I thought it was. And last week at a class, um, someone corrected me, and that was fine. But I said, every nurse? I, I mean, I, that's private information. And so we always, I know the pain nurses um, do it underneath the umbrella of the providers they're working with. So. On that license. Yeah. Okay. If it's, if it's this patient, okay. If it's this provider, if I don't have access, even if the provider tells me to, I cannot. You, you can't do it. Okay. Yes, I knew that. Okay. 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 Any more to add? To? Yes. Okay. Um, well, it was a little bit complex. I'll try to repeat it. Um, this particular person works with a population that's more kind of immediately cited. In other words, that you may add non-drug interventions and other multimodal, but the patient will come back and they didn't get to PT, they didn't go do ABC, they didn't do the ice or heat or whatever. They're really looking for, hand me that script. Is that what I'm hearing? Okay, and what do we do with that kind of patient? Who has some suggestions? Educate. Educate. Well, you have to figure out what motivates them, too. Mm -hmm. just providing education, you have to tap into what's important to them. And that's take so much of the time. time. And there's um, conferences you can go to to learn how to do that motivational interviewing. Mm -hmm. And that does help, uh, helping them to come up with what's important to them. Mm -hmm. The whole culture has to change, yeah. Rather than, I, I've said before, in the patient's defense, you know, we created some of this, writing scripts, right? I mean, they got a script from somebody. Um, and, and so that, that model became, think of it if I was 500 pounds and had high blood pressure, but I want to come to you and get a, a script to take for my hypertension. I don't want to do everything else involved. Or I'll take insulin to manage my diabetes, but I don't want to do everything else involved. And the same is true with pain. Um, I don't want to do all the rest. Um, 
but we have to have those conversations. You're right. Um, I know some of the physicians I've worked with um, do a written plan. They're really specific with the patient. And if that means weaning down off these doses that are extremely high, or they're on three or four or five, different medications, they'll be really specific with the patient. They'll be very glad to help them, but it's a two-way street. But I, I'm with you, it is not quick or easy. And it's often why um, it's hard for our primary care providers to do that when they have a five or 10 minute timed visit. It's very hard. It's very hard for any of your specialties. They are not quick conversations. And there's so much of the behavioral health piece. Yeah, you see, I didn't have an easy answer. I know it. It's not easy. I know the motivational interviewing. I've known a lot of nurses and a social worker that took that course. There's some of it available online. They thought it was incredible to kind of help them hone down on some of those questions. It takes, time. It takes a lot of time. Yes? Yeah. Sometimes it's co pays. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it shouldn't excuse everybody. But yeah. We, we have to explore that. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to flip through the rest of these, everyone, and then we'll ask, take any other um, questions. I did want to define um, some addiction, dependence, and tolerance. So in your handouts or up here, um, you have that physical dependence is a substance dependence, also known as drug dependence. It's an adaptive state that develops from repeated drug administration and, and which results in withdrawal upon cessation of drug use. Um, examples, cocaine, tobacco, barbiturates, alcohol, um, of course, marijuana. So what that means is my body gets dependent on that so that if I stop at cold turkey, I'm gonna have some kind of drug withdrawal. Okay, so in addition to opiates, we see it with lots of different medication classes, don't we? You know that if something's cut off cold turkey, think about prednisone or a steroid if you had really bad poison ivy and how that may be weaned down rather than stopped cold turkey. Okay, it's a physical phenomenon. Drug withdrawal is a group of symptoms that occur upon abrupt discontinuation and great examples um, in our lecture before about withdrawal and what you see and why and that was wonderful to really be able to see what those side effects are caused from based on that pain physiology. Um, position statement, I put this on here from um, ASPMN, the American Society for Pain Management Nursing and the International Nurses Society on Addiction, which is um, INSTA and a lot of you have probably heard of both of these. It's a really good position statement on uh, pain management with patients with substance abuse disorders. It's a little bit long, so I won't go through it. Um, but you know, please, if there's any of this that you want, please email me. And I will, I'll put my email back up there right when we're done over break. Um, I'll send you any of this. I'll send you my PowerPoints if you want them. And then you'd have some of these references. Um, and they're good. They're good references to have. We know the cost of addiction. Um, it's a chronic disease by drug seeking and use that is compulsive or difficult to control despite the harm. Um, we know the overall cost exceeds 600 billion annually. And that again is probably conservative. So you take that and then you take the issue of chronic pain. And again, can't you see why if we could join some forces and really look at both sides of that fence, um, we might get a lot of work done. Strong correlation between addiction, poverty, and abuse. Um, increased insurance premiums can happen if somebody has a history of addiction or an active addiction. Increased medical costs and health problems, of course. And the legal bills with DUIs and other Bills. It can be quite staggering. Um, a lot of you may know if it's been family or friends. Um, so in summary, remember the difference between drug addiction and chronic pain. One size does not fit all with those pain guidelines. I really encourage you though, if one or two of those really hit your attention, 
get those up and read them. Use them as you work in your places. Take a look and be ready to ask questions. Um, there's lots and lots and lots of work for all of us to do. Look for solid research. Look for what's evidence-based. Um, there's some solid evidence-based practices out there. There's also some that are very gray and we need more work. And of course, advocating for pain management and pain patients. Um, again, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm gonna increase that dose of opiate or encourage another script. No, no, no. But it does mean I'm gonna try to support that patient and see what we can do to help them. Thank you.